Okay, so we're now uh, being joined by folk online and uh, we think we saw the technical issues that we had in the last couple of weeks, so they won't have to wait for just to watch the recording, but uh, they could be famous last words. Um, but one thing we are sure of is that when we meet together, we meet with our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can call you Father. Thank you for that promise uh, that was made to us, that we could call you Abba, Daddy. Lord, it, it fills our minds with wonder and all kinds of awe as we consider that the God who made the universe, the God who speaks the word and worlds come into being, would allow us to call him Father. We come and honour you for your goodness, your greatness, the wonders of your love and of your majesty, your power and your dominion. We ask that you, our Father, would make your presence known among us today by your Spirit. Help us to honour you in all we do and say and think and listen to. May our souls praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand as if you want uh, and are able as we uh, watch and listen and perhaps just quietly um, join in with Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. What did I say about technical issues? Thank you. Please be seated. We are trying to um, 
include people who are at home. And, and as I've said before, one day uh, soon we hope people will be able to, to do a reading just from the comfort of their home live. But today it's my Ruth reading one of the, the readings, the first reading, and it's, it's recorded. The reading is taken from Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim. There there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarrelled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? They weren't very grateful, were they? Uh, God had taken them out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. But how quickly that they forgot, and I suppose we're all the same, aren't we? We're, we're like that. We, we, we get used to the new normal, whatever it is, even if it's bad, and, and, but particularly if it's good. Um, and then something happens. And we say, God, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Even though it's something that we've asked him to do. We're going to spend some moments in quietness, first of all, just saying to God in our own, our own hearts, those things that he brings to our minds that we've done that displease him. And then I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we confess that sometimes when we have failed in thought, in word, or in deed, we fail to notice. Perhaps because of the busyness of our lives or because of the fact that we're obsessed with or focused on something else, we fail to see how we have failed you. Oh Lord, we ask that by your Spirit you would open our hearts and our minds and our very souls to see what we have done against you. Help us, Lord, we pray, to admit our sin. For, Lord, we know that when we admit our sin against you, you are gracious and good and long to forgive us. And so, Lord, we come and ask for forgiveness for those things that we've done and said and thought that displease you, not because we deserve it, for we do not, not because we may do better next time, because we may not, but simply because you have promised your forgiveness. And we trust you. And we accept that forgiveness, Lord, that you bought at the, the death of your son on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for his cry, it is finished. And Lord, together we accept that it is finished as far as we are concerned what he has done for us, what he has achieved for all eternity. We thank you for that forgiveness, and we pray that by your Spirit you would give us the strength, give us the willingness to live in the light of that forgiveness, to leave behind that past that would drag us down, that, that the enemy would use to tell us that we are of no use to you, when in fact we are the redeemed people of God. Burn it into our souls, we pray, as you burned the lips of Isaiah when you touched his lips with a coal from the altar and told him that he was clean. Help us to know it in all its reality, we pray. 
Amen. We don't always declare God's glory like we should, not just with our lips, but also with our lives. But the song we're about to sing speaks about heaven declaring God's glory. All heaven declares. We'll stand. In, in, in a moment or two, we're, we're going to pray for our world. Um, but just to say, obviously, because uh, what's been going on, there are things that we just can't do as once we've done. In the autumn, normally we'd have a harvest festival service. Normally it would be part, of, we'd, we'd involve the brigades and that would be a parade service. But we're, we're going to do something about harvest. Um, it will be on the 11th, and those who come, We'll be able to share in that. But as part of that, if you've been watching on YouTube, there is a link below the, the video um, to HARP, which is the uh, South End Homeless uh, Charity. Um, and what they're encouraging people to do this year, um, because places can't gather stuff, is to become the, the agent for them in your street or in your close. And we just want to encourage you, uh, uh, each one of us as a church, to do that to gather it, whatever is gathered by your neighbors and given to you, we will pick up and take to harp so you don't have to do it. Um, go on the link. Um, the link will also be on our website and it'll be up on our um, Facebook during the week. Um, if you want some printed leaflets to hand out to your neighbors and a poster to go in the window, we can produce those for you. Um, and then at, uh, we're going to start the, the collecting from next weekend for a week until the 11th. And then uh, we'll be able to share some of the goodness of, of what God's given us with those who quite often literally have absolutely nothing. And on the 11th, uh, we're going to have, I hope, all sorts of people involved um, by recording and by live and all sorts of things. I've just given the team at the back collie wobbles uh, in saying that. But uh, we just, because we don't want to share out and miss out in thanking God for his goodness. Um, I've also got a video of some people in their allotment that will be part of it as well. Um, so that we just want to celebrate God's love and God's care. But as we uh, begin today, um, I'm going to encourage us to pray together um, what is known as the parliamentary prayer. Uh, 
It's a prayer that begins each parliamentary session in the House of Commons. And I encourage you here and those elsewhere to pray, and then I'll, I'll lead us in, in prayer. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our Queen and her government, to members of Parliament and all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your Spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideals, but laying aside all private interests and prejudices, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all mankind. So may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed. Amen. We're going to pray for a church called Burlington Baptist Church. It's on the edge of Ipswich. And uh, Jane will put um, some slides up about that, but I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Burlington Baptist Church, that large Baptist church on the east side of, uh, of Ipswich. And as they, like us, have begun to meet together in person again, while also um, sharing it online, we pray that you would give them wisdom about what else they can open, about how else they can serve their community. Thank you, Lord, for the normal bus busy schedule of things that are for folk outside the church. And we pray that you would help them, Lord, to meet the needs of the community once more. Father, we pray for the protection of those attending the services and, and ask that you would give the minister and the deacons uh, a real sense of what is right and what is good. And, and like we prayed for Parliament, help them to do nothing out of selfish ambition or just simply in order to please others. And we pray too, Lord, for their involvement in that nearby community of Kesgrave, where a teenager was shot recently. Know, Lord, that many churches in the area are seeking to be peacemakers there. Give them wisdom, and by your Spirit, give them courage to do your work. And Father, as we said that prayer together and prayed for Parliament, we, we simply ask that you would bring it into being. We pray first of all for those, Lord, who, who are members of Parliament who profess to belong to you, who've given their lives into your hands and are seeking to serve you as they serve us in Parliament. We ask, Lord, that you would give them that, that wisdom from above, that listening ear and that open heart to be your people. Give them courage to speak for what is right. And Father, I pray too for those who don't profess to believe in you, May you surprise them with the thoughts that you put in their hearts and in their minds, with the ways that they are persuaded by the petitions of their, um, those who voted for them and, and those who didn't, and other parliamentarians. We pray for our Queen and her government, that they may be and do what is right. Lord, we pray for our nation. Nation beset by a few things. Lord, we first of all realize that we are not the worst off people in the world. That as a nation, we are better off than many. And Lord, that's only in your grace. And so we pray for ourselves as a nation as we seek to, to work through these issues and these problems that you would help us also to lift our eyes to those around, to those like the homeless in our own area, those who have homes but no food in the cupboards and no money to put in the electric or the gas meter, those who find life tough in normal circumstances and now don't know just where to turn. Give us compassionate hearts, Lord, for those behind the doors, even in our own close, perhaps our own street. And help us, Lord, to share your love with all. Thank you, Lord, for those who've been able to gather today, and thank you for those who have not. For those who join us through all kinds of different technology. Lord, we pray that by your Spirit, that it's only by your Spirit that it can happen, 
that you would help us to be and to feel as one. Help us, Lord, we pray, to be together for the sake of each other and for the sake of our world. We thank you, Lord, for those who've been through difficult times and have gained some measure of healing. We thank you for those who are beginning to venture out again after some time shut in. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings that have been poured into their lives in times when they were alone. Lord, we don't know the future, but you do. And so we put ourselves in your hands. Lord, we don't trust in armies or in leaders. We trust in the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Ray is going to come to read to us. In Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32. And talking about Jesus. Then he went back in the temple, teaching. The high priests and leaders of the people came up and demanded, Show us your credentials. Who authorised you to teach here? Jesus replied, First, let me ask you a question. You answer my question, and I'll answer yours. About the baptism of John, who authorised it, heaven or humans? They were in a spot and knew it. They pulled, pulled, pulled back into a huddle and whispered, If we say heaven, he'll ask us why we don't believe him. If we say humans, we're up against it with the people, because they all hold John up as a prophet. They decided to concede that round to Jesus. We don't know, they answered. Then neither, sorry, Jesus said, then neither will I answer your question. Tell me what you think of this story. A man had two sons. He went up to the first and said, Son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. The son answered, I don't want to. Later on, he thought better of it and went. The father gave the same command to the second son. He answered, sure, glad to, but he never went. Which of the two sons did what the father asked? They said, the first. Jesus said, yes, and I tell you that crooks and whores are going to precede you into, the, into, God's king, into God's kingdom. John came to you, showing you the right, right road. You turned up your noses at him, but the crooks and whores who believed him. Even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and, and believe him. John the Baptist came and Jesus the Redeemer came and still they didn't want to know. But any of us, any of us can put our trust in that one who brought us back from sin and death. We'll stand to sing. Well, not sing. There is a Redeemer. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah. 
Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, In the last few weeks, it, um, the, the, the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain has been celebrated. It's normally celebrated on the Sunday closest to the 15th. It was on the 15th of September that the Germans launched their greatest raid and had their greatest losses. The war is a, the war, the Second World War is, one of those things gets brought up in all kinds of situations. And people use it for all kinds of reasons. Hark back to it for all kinds of um, attempts to jolly us up or get us going or say we can cope with this or we can cope with that. But for some, it wasn't obvious that the war was coming. For some, it was. For W.H. Auden, for instance, he was living in Berlin in 1938 and 39, and he wrote this about someone very famous in Germany at the time. He said, perfection of a kind is, was what he was after, and the poetry he invented was easy to understand. He knew human folly like the back of his hand and was greatly interested in armies and fleets. When he laughed, respectable senators burst with laughter. And when he cried, the children died in the streets. Yet in the summer of 1939, Lord Rothermere was still appealing to Hitler not to provoke a war, saying that Britain and Nazi Germany must remain at peace. And he said, well, I find shocking words. He said, our two great Nordic countries should pursue resolutely a policy of appeasement. For whatever anyone may say, our two great countries should be the leaders of the world. And if Lord Halifax had become Prime Minister, Rothermere would have had his way. But instead, someone else someone who was a bit of a pain in the neck to the authorities and to his own party, the Conservative Party, became Prime Minister. And when speaking to the nation, he said these words, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. 
We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I can say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. You know what? We don't see things coming as human beings. We like to live in this land of everything will be all right until suddenly it isn't. And the truth be told, before the Second World War, many because they didn't want another war, they'd been through one and that was bad enough. They even called it the war to end all wars, the First World War. They wanted things to be okay. They wanted everything to be fine. And so they said everything was fine. And very few, Auden and Churchill among them, saw the horrors that were coming. And so it is with salvation. So it is with eternal life. So it is with what really life is all about. As long as things are fine and as long as things are going well, Along we go. That's what the leaders were doing in Jesus' day until, first of all, John the Baptist comes along and then Jesus comes along. And as Jesus said to them at another point, you know, you're never happy. John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine and, and I come and you call me a, a glutton and a, and a drunkard and, and neither of us are good for you because you don't like either of us. And they didn't because both upset the status quo. You see, they'd been invaded. The Romans were in charge, but the leaders, the leaders were in cahoots with the Romans. They sort of lived together. And they were in charge of all religious things, whereas the Romans were in charge of civil things. And they liked it the way it was. Oh, there, were, there had been some who'd rebelled, but they liked it the way it was. And now, first of all, John comes, and then Jesus comes. And they don't like it. And partly they don't like it because they know that he has authority that they don't. Some of their spies sent out to, to listen to Jesus come back and say, he speaks with authority like we've never heard before. And so they have to challenge him because he was challenging the status quo. When they come along and they say, who gives you authority to speak like this? And Jesus, as he often does, answers with that question. Well, you tell me the answer to the John the Baptist question, I'll tell you the answer to mine. And of course, he had them exactly where he wanted them. And it's where often leaders are. Caught between what they know to be true, what they've done, and what the people think. Because, you see, these were people who just wanted to keep the peace. These were people who just wanted to say everything was fine and everything was wonderful. No need to worry. Nothing to see here. Just obey the rules that we give you and everything will be fine. John comes saying, repent and be baptized. Jesus comes and talks about the, the, the Father um, coming and, and being among them. He talks with authority that they'd never heard before. They all just used to quote each other for authority. He speaks of his own authority. And they're threatened. And we hear that whispering among them. Well, we can't say it was, he's from God, because this man, Jesus, will say, why didn't you do what John said then? And we can't say it's of human, because the people thought he was a prophet. And I hear these words speak to me, first of all. Because as the minister of this church and as one of the leaders of this church, I pray that God will give me grace never to be in the position of these leaders. Never to be in the position where I've heard from God through someone like John the Baptist, 
heard for what God wants to say, but it's going to upset the apple cart. It's going to make things different. It's going to maybe threaten my authority or threaten the leadership's authority or the church's authority. And so we ignore what God has to say. Well, may God, God give us grace never to be in that position. But that's how they got there. They heard John. Oh, they knew. But it was too much trouble. But then the question comes to you as well as me. You ever been in that position where you've been challenged about something about your Christian life and you can't answer it because actually what you do and what you say doesn't add up? And it didn't for these religious leaders. They were afraid of the people. They were afraid of change. They were afraid of everything, except they weren't afraid enough of the Lord of heaven and earth. And it's time we were afraid of him. I don't mean terrified, running away, screaming, scared. But I mean that sense that, yes, we can call him Abba Father, as I prayed earlier on, but here is the God of heaven and earth. And when he says something and we don't agree with it, then 100% of the time, I'm wrong, you're wrong. What God says is right, and what God proclaims is right. And if it's different to what we've grown up with, and if it's different to how we've understood things, it's wrong. Because God has said something. We need to obey. Who has the authority? Well, it's God himself. It wasn't them. And John's authority and Jesus' authority came from God himself. And he needs to be in charge of our lives as individuals, but as a body as well. We'll come on to the individual thing in a bit. He tells a story. And it, I can imagine them cringing. He tells this story. Of, and you can imagine it happening. I mean, it's probably happened in your family. Um, maybe you were the one who did it. Uh, a parent asks a child to do something. Well, two children in this case. The first one... He says, will you do this for me? Please help me out. I need some help on this. Will you go and do it? And the son, well, he's caught him at a bad moment. And he said, no, I won't. Mm -hmm. You ever said that to your parents? I know I have. <sighs> no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I can remember the the day that God called me into full-time Christian service. Um, it was the days, if you can imagine it out there in technology land, it was the days before you were able to record TV programs. I know, shocking, isn't it? Um, the days when, yeah, I think there were four channels. It might have only been three, but it, uh, no more than four on the television. And we'd, we'd not had color that long. And they were going, my parents were going to a missionary convention and I didn't want to go because the Great Escape was on. And it had never been on before. Or was it the Battle of Britain? You see, I can't even remember that. But it was one of those. I did not want to go. I said, I'm not going. Well, I did. <laughs> and God called me that day. So the first son, he says no, but... For whatever reason, he thinks of about it, and he, maybe he thinks of his poor old dad, and he thinks of maybe he's, he was a bit too harsh. But for, for whatever reason, he turns around and he goes and does what he's been asked to do. The second one, well, he's, he's the charmer. Because the bad dad says, will you go and do this for me? And the second son says, of course I will. I, I can imagine him saying, anything for you, dad. You know, you know anything. You can always ask me for anything. I'll, I'll do it for you. But his father goes on, and the second son goes away. Jesus asks, you know, who did the right thing? And it's obvious, the one who went. But you know what? It's not so obvious. It's not so obvious sometimes. Sometimes it's not obvious at all. In life in general, and in church life too, there are those who go, yeah, I'll do anything for you do whatever you want, who are kind and affable and amenable, but once you're not looking, can't be bothered really. Because like that second son, just wouldn't want to be thought well of. And there are those who make no fuss, 
who perhaps even when asked say, well, I'm not sure I can, but turn out doing it. But more importantly than in the life of the church and in our relationships together, what about God? As individuals, what about God? When God says to you or to me, and we know it's him, and oh, I've done enough hemming and hamming, uh, hem, hemming, hemming and, uh, I've used lost my words, shilly-shallying around saying, oh, does God really want me to do this when I know fine well that God wants me to do it? Um, too many excuses, too much of the time. I've got to the point in my life when when God says do something, then, then that's what I want to do. Not just for his sake, but for mine as well. Because I've seen the consequences of going against what God wants and walking the other way. What about that neighbor that just needs a smile rather than a frown, or that person who needs a phone call, or that person that God puts in your mind and you can't get them out of your mind and you don't know why and you'd be embarrassed to make contact but you just have to because God's put them there. Forget about making a big show of saying yes to this and that and everything else. Just get on with what God wants. Because the adulation of those around us will come if we make a big fuss and we say we'll do this and we'll do that. But the favor of God comes from simply obeying and doing as well. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it because they didn't want to see it. They were stuck in their religious, re religiosity. They were stuck in their religion. I've had people over the years ask me why I'm religious my answer automatically is always, I'm not. And they look at you as if you're mad. I must have people often look at me, but they look at you as if you're mad, and they go, what do you mean you're not religious? You're a, you're a minister. You go to church, don't you? I go, yeah, but I'm not religious. See, it's not about religion. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about doing the right thing at the right time and uh, going through the right rituals. It's about a relationship with God. It's about finding salvation. And often it's the very religious people who have trouble finding it. Christianity is not a religion. It's the truth, and it's about a relationship with our Heavenly Father, that relationship we should have had from the very beginning, but someone fell, and we broke that relationship with God. And now he points the finger at them and he says, and they would have been very uncomfortable at this point because they knew he had authority and they knew the people were listening. He said, yeah, John came and preached and the tax collectors and the prostitutes listened and you didn't. And even now, these tax collectors and these prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God before you. Oh, they didn't like that. And it would end in his death because they didn't like that at all. And you know what? We still don't like it. We still don't like it. We get inoculated by coming to church sometimes. Now, I'm not knocking, uh, meeting together because it's, it's, it's great. And I'm just sad that we're not all able to meet together in the same place. But we get into our routines, our way of doing things, and we think that, it's, that all that it's about is when we gather together with the others of God's people and maybe we sing his praises. But actually, no, it's not. It's about a relationship with this one who came and the, the tax collectors, the reprobates, and the prostitutes heard the message of repent, believe, and be baptized and find life and find the kingdom. That's what this is about. That's why this building was built. That's why it says out there as you come in to the glory of God. Because that's what it's about. It's not about the glory of uh, Friars Baptist Church. It's not about the glory of the Reverend Duncan Keys. Um, it's not about the glory of this church. And it's not about us bigging ourselves up and saying we're going to do this and do that and whatever. It's about us as individuals and as a body hearing what God has to say, beginning with salvation. Salvation comes to you and to me, not because we deserve it, because I'll tell you what, I don't. I still don't, and I never will deserve what God has done for me. Nothing that I've even attempted to do could ever begin to make up for the, fact, the way I have failed him. 
through my life. But he gives me salvation anyway. Because I don't deserve it, it comes as a free gift. It comes to the worst of the worst. And it can come to the best of the best if they'll only realize that they're not really the best of the best. And that was the problem of the leaders. Repent and believe, he says. All those folk that you've looked down on is really what he's saying to them. All those folk that you think are useless, that will never be part of the kingdom of God. All those folk are getting into the kingdom before you. I just find that a wonderful thought, a wonderful picture. These religious people who were so tied up in their rules and regulations, who thought they were the bee's knees, who thought they were God's favorites, And all these people that they thought of as horrible, probably thought of as the scum of the earth, were getting into God's kingdom before them. So don't let the enemy tell you that you are not worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. For you are not, but God will make you worthy and will bring you into his kingdom. It begins with that salvation. It begins with that salvation. It begins as we put our lives into God's hands, as we give him the authority. It begins rather than saying yes and walking the other way, having lip service to following God. We actually say, I've been saying no all my life, a bit like that. I can't remember what he's called. And the vicar of Dibley, that shows my age. He would always go, yes, 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 no. Or no, 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 yes. I think it was Jim. Um, But that's what God wants from us, from all those no's that we've had in our lives, to finally say, Yes, and walk in his way. You out there, you can find it like those here have found it. If you're willing to allow him to have authority over your life, willing to allow him to be in charge. Oh, it won't be easy. Don't let anyone ever tell you that the Christian life is easy because you will be disappointed. It's not easy. And in fact, I need to be more like Churchill than maybe some of our present leaders when it comes to this. What did he say? I'll read it to you again to get it into the right order. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. But when he was asked, what is our policy? What is our aim? It is victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. I would substitute in there the word salvation. What is our aim as a church? What is our aim as individuals is to to allow others to find that same salvation that we ourselves have found. Oh, it is hard and it is tough. And there are times when we wonder why we're doing what we're doing perhaps because of the others around us, perhaps just because of all that life throws at us. But like Churchill before the beginning of the Second World War, as things were getting bad, things hadn't really begun to start. He said, victory at all costs. Salvation at all costs. That's what it's about. And I long for the day when all the people around us who perhaps others look down on and perhaps they even look down on themselves find it possible to find salvation. To walk through these doors, heads held high, not because they're proud of what they've done, but because they know what Christ has done for them. Amen. We're going to sing. Let's stand.
you for that promise that you will hold us fast. We thank you for that promise that comes because of what Jesus, your son, has done on the cross. That comes because your spirit is at work in our lives. Lord, go with us as we leave, as we part either by going home physically or by switching off technology. May we know your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit. And uh, we'll uh, say goodbye to folk at home. I uh, hope that you've been blessed by joining in with us. Goodbye. They've gone. And, uh, sorry, but it's a little cold this morning. That's because um, when Jeff came to put the heating on, it wouldn't do what he was telling it to do. <laughs> we don't know why, um, but that will be sorted. I suppose if you neglect something for six months and it get, takes the hump and <laughs> decides not to go. But no, it, it, it wouldn't work, unfortunately, um, for some reason. So um, sorry about that. But we hope that it will be warmer here next week when we come together. Do watch out for our uh, emails. We're changing the way we're sending emails. Um, Jane's actually begun to use a whole new system that should mean that emails get through uh, much more easily. Uh, but also watch our Facebook page for, as we prepare to, um, to collect stuff from next, next weekend um, leading up to harvest on the 11th. Thank you. And as I've said before, uh, please don't congregate within the building. Once you're out, you're no longer my responsibility. It is the open air. Feel free to chat out there, but please uh, leave sort of keeping your social distance from each other. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Cool.